At an age where he could be forgiven for sitting at home with his feet up, 84-year-old Dick Whittington is making a long journey. To a place he hasn't seen in nearly three decades. Dick was the cultural advisor to the Cocos Malay community in the run-up to the Cocos Islands integration with Australia. He's back, not just to meet old friends, but to once again fight for their rights. Inside each heart is a resentment that they have been lied to, that the promises have not been kept, and it is time, high time for the Australian government to start to clean up this mess. The Cocos Islands have a peculiar history, a past which in many ways defines the present. Life in the Cocos is utopian. Infectious diseases are almost unknown. Life is so pleasant that most are content to end their days there. For 150 years, this speck in the Indian Ocean was the private fiefdom of the Clooney's Ross family, who brought in hundreds of Malays to harvest their coconut plantations. These girls are not wearing their Sunday best. This is their normal work attire, as they skillfully slice up the coconut. It was a unique remnant of colonialism, out of step with the modern world. According to all accounts, the islanders favour integration, not independence. It won't mean much of a change, except that they'll have all the rights of Australian citizens. And so in 1984, in a UN-sponsored vote, the Cocos Malays charted a new course. As far as the elders who negotiated the agreement to integrate with Australia are concerned, the past 28 years has been littered with broken promises. They say the assurances they received in the run-up to the vote were not worth the paper they were written on. <laughs> Creeb and Haig is one of those elders. He and Dick helped draw up the deal to join with the mainland. So lucky, mate. Like uh, to, to know this is part of Australia is unbelievable, and we've got thank you to thank for it. Yeah. You are just so lucky. The tourists are appreciative, and there was a time when the Australian government was thankful too. <laughs> Both men were awarded the Order of Australia Medal for their efforts, but Cree thinks his people have been shortchanged. Memang kekuatiran saya sekarang semua pelajaran, semua pekerjaan. Nang belum boleh berkembang, belum banyak berkembang di Pulau Kokos misi banyak pengaruh daripada orang luar. The act of self-determination was based on a promise that the islanders' Islamic faith and customs would be respected and that they would be given ownership of the land. Land is central to the whole argument. The Cocos Malays were told by the United Nations, the United Nations said, this is your land. They confirmed that much in a letter to the then Minister for Territories, Tom Uren. 
The Cocos Malay people were all very happy to hear that it is the government's intention to give all of the land of the Cocos Island to the Malay people. We are also pleased to know that the government will ensure that no outsider are allowed to settle here and that no outsider will be permitted to buy our land. And it was in black and white, it was quite clear. No, no equivocation, no uh, ambiguity about it at all. It, those words meant what, they, what they, they said, and that is what the Australian government promised. But that is not how it turned out. The territory eventually split between trust and crown land, creating two distinct communities on two separate islands. One pious, the other less so. The laid-back lifestyle and duty-free alcohol, a draw card for many of the 150 mainly white Australians who live on West Island, some of whom have now bought their homes in contravention of the promises given at the time of integration. While just half an hour's ferry ride away on Home Island, 450 Cocos Malays live on trust land in rented homes that they can never buy. It's not really like that. It's not the fact that the whites are here and the, and, and the brown people well, are Well, they there. are, and of course, if, if you don't bump into the other side of things every day, then, then people have gone in their own directions. Pauline Bunce is a former teacher in Cocos. She wrote a book on the island's history. She is disturbed by what she says is a growing divide between the two communities. In terms of a sort of emotional distance or cultural appreciation, I think the two have got further apart in the last five or six years. It's, it's ironic perhaps that the nearest community to the Cocos Malay community probably has the least respect for it. <laughs> Those divisions were widened recently when the leading tourist operator on West Island accused the Cocos Malays of being lazy dole bludgers. With chronic unemployment and underemployment, less than half of Home Island's residents are working, and those that are are employed in largely menial jobs. In the 28 years since the Cocos Malay population voted to integrate with Australia, not one Cocos Malay has managed to make it to any position of influence. The nurses, teachers, senior administrators at the Shire Council are all white and always have been. Even the manager of the cooperative, set up to benefit the Cocos Malays, is a white Australian. In relative terms, Nora Guyu is a Cocos Malay success story, a student nurse in Perth. She is back home visiting her family, but she hopes one day to return for good. The permanent nurse here, she was telling me that, you know, yes, you will get employed later on in the years after you graduate, but you have to gain your experience. Like many in her community, she complains about the existence of a glass ceiling on Cocos. When a job comes up, do you think it's easier for a white person than it is for a Cocos Malay? Um, I'm not saying that it's easier, but usually they get put forward, like they get put first. It's not that my own opinion, but it had happened so many times. If there's jobs available, I'm sure that they'd be filled. Um, but obviously, you know, on a small islands like these, there's just not the amount of jobs available. Peter Clark is the CEO of the Shire Council, one of three mainland Australians who run the islands. He says he is keen to see more Cocos Malays in positions of power. We'd encourage people to um, take up uh, positions in local governments on the mainland, learn the ropes and then have the ability to come back here and take up those senior roles in time. And are people doing that now? Well, not that I'm aware of. Uh, we had a person apply for a position as Deputy CEO. I would have loved to have employed him, but he just needed that experience out in, in the industry. The man in question thinks there is more to it than that. Personally, I think it comes down to racial discrimination. One, two, three, three.
It's the annual football tournament for Cocos Malays who now call the Australian mainland home. More of them now live and work in WA than on the islands themselves, but some would desperately like to return. Maddie Signa is the first born and bred Cocos Malay to graduate from university. A public servant on the mainland, he has found it impossible to secure a similar position in Cocos, despite repeated attempts at trying. Why are we able to get jobs that are equivalent to the senior positions on Ireland over here on the mainland, and yet we're not good enough for Cocos? I just think nepotism's rife on Ireland. Well, no one wants to, to say that that actually exists, but, you know, if you speak to Cocos Malays off camera, they will say that to you. And by nepotism, you mean white people who have already got jobs helping their friends and family to get jobs? Correct. There is still the white master in many different facets, in many different faces. Maddie's wife, Cartini, is a qualified teacher with 10 years experience. She too has tried and failed to get a job on the islands. We've always been in a position to assist, you know, education assistant, medical assistant, admin assistants. We're never good enough except to assist. There will always be some white guy ahead of us. And it's not because, because we're not good, as good as them, it's just because that's the way it is. Even when opportunities arise, the Caucasus Malay community feels frozen out. In the past few years, the federal government has spent hundreds of millions of dollars upgrading the infrastructure here. This jetty has only recently been completed. Now the airport runway is going through a major upgrade. Both contracts awarded to Australian companies, the workers flown in from the mainland to do jobs that the Caucasus Malays say they could easily have done themselves. What sort of specialised skills would you need to lay asphalt on the runway? I sincerely think that those are the decisions that condone Cocos Malays to become Centrelink dependent. 500 in 60 minutes. No worries, mate. For the most part, the community's specialised skills are no longer needed or valued except by visiting tourists. Mom, how did they do that? Aussie's cultural tour, giving expert craftsmen a rare chance to show off their talents. Because we had a saying here about the tradition or the custom. It is okay to lose your children, but it's not okay to lose your custom. The Caucasus Malays have retained their customs, but they say they have lost their influence. They used to have their own council and their own cultural advisor, but are now represented by a council that serves both communities, which does its business in English and is managed by mainland Australians. What they're missing is a, is a sense of direction, that there's a captain to this ship, that the place is going somewhere, that someone knows what's around the corner, that there is no on-island leadership. It's just uh, a lack of care, really, a lack of interest in, in a multicultural community. A relative newcomer to the islands, Tony Lacey is trying to change things for the better. Working with Cocos Malay elders, he's planning to resurrect this overgrown farm to grow products both for local consumption and for export, one of a myriad of projects that he says could be set up to ease the unemployment crisis. There's a lot of red tape, but there is red tape in any federal system for necessary reasons, but this is just, uh, this is just a bit too much. Hence the reason that nothing happens here. Education is another area of contention. Although young Caucasus Malays speak their native tongue at home, at school they are taught in English from day one. If the prevailing attitude is that that language, that home language, their core language is somehow their worst enemy and the biggest deficit they could have in learning English, 
then that undermines their whole self-confidence. Is it a contributing factor for why perhaps the Cocos Malay population have not done as well through the education system as they might have? I think so. I think they're caught between the two languages. It's hard to define the impact, but since Australia took responsibility for education, just 11 Cocos Malays have gone on to graduate from university. The WA Department of Education, on our behalf, provides that curriculum and that's the appropriate one for that, for that community. The island's acting administrator, Steve Clay, insists the approach to teaching English is not an issue and he is surprised when we tell him about the growing animosity between the two communities. Really, there needs to be um, a concerted effort to, uh, to make sure that doesn't occur. If that's the case, then, then I'm actually I'm really disappointed and, and we need to do better than that. It's a 600 kilometre journey to get someone to talk about Caucus. The islands are administered from Christmas Island. Part of the problem, according to some. Everything that happens here shows the duplicity, the double dealing, the lack of respect. Sampai di ujung jalan nang budak-budak kita boleh berdiri di atas kaki sendiri, boleh tanggung kehidupan sendiri di Pulau Kokos. Bagaimana tanah besar? Kalau tidak, boleh dibilang ni kita orang Pulau mesti balik pergi di jajahan lagi. Orang di bawah orang di bawah perintah, orang di bawah perintah macam dulu di di bawah jajahan kan. They're living in a time warp, you know, they're constantly drifting in a doldrum, so to speak. And I think all we need is a slight wind of change to be able to push us forward, empower us. And that's all I'm asking. It's about helping my community prosper.